problem with this virus, and I deliberately am trying to no longer use its name, because I think that we are giving it power beyond what it should have, because we won't all die. Some people will die, and some have already died. But we are not here to be locked into a future that's created by a virus or anything else. I'm a very clear believer on the, in that. Um, the future is what we make of it. The future is not what a virus tells us to do. Um, or a government, we've all had this problem with all governments around the world. You know, we've got a mad prime minister, you've had your issues, Trump is crazy, Russia seems crazy, everybody's crazy at the moment. Nobody seems to be sensible, other than the two women that run the world in New Zealand and in Germany. Um, and I say this with great love, because I think if women run the world, we may have a better place. Um, so, so what I want to talk about is where does this COVID thing leave us um, because I've come across a lot of despair um, and that's concerned me um, because a lot of the large companies that I've dealt with in my life seem to be almost locked into um, a belief that this must now just get over and done with and then life will go back to normal and everything will be fine. Now, I think that's largely true. I don't think the whole world is going to change because of a virus. I fundamentally don't believe it. I think it gave a lot of us time for reflection and time that we were forced to stay indoors and ask questions and live with people that maybe we don't always um, know as well because you guys will know that often the kids you have and the people you deal with, you don't really get to know well until you spend weeks and months with them in one space. I'm very clear on it because in this place, the space is much, much smaller. You know, there are people that five, six people like in townships that live in a tiny little area because they can't afford a bigger house. So, so I, think, I think it's forced us to contemplate and reflect, and I think that's a good thing. Um, I think it's forced more countries to go online. The online thing here is big. Uh, I mean, I've always, since I arrived, you had meetings around the world at any hour on Zoom calls and other calls. Um, so this for me is not that unusual, but it is unusual to, to, to large parts of the world. And I think that's a good thing. I think people buying online, I think it's a good thing. I, I do think it will destroy some industries and that will be a pity. Um, but some industries, you know, frankly, we can do without, so that won't be a pity. So, so, my, so what I want to speak about um, briefly with you guys is, how do we treat this COVID, call it, um, explosion that took place and is still taking place in parts of the world as we speak? Does it leave us with despair? Because my notion is most people almost got trapped in a, in a cycle of fear. Now, unfortunately, if we get trapped in a cycle of fear, it's very difficult for us to do anything about it because fear becomes such a big obsession that you almost become incapable of thinking beyond that fear. Um, and I experienced the same. In February of this year, I, I, had to, I had to go to Tanzania, then I had to go to America, and then I was supposed to go to South Africa, all literally in three weeks. And, 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 and then the, the last trip was canceled to South Africa for the lockdown reasons. Um, but in that period of time, I lost 80% of my income literally overnight. I'm now back to 400% more income, five months later, four months later. I really had to work my butt off. Guys, this was not easy. But it made me realize something quite fundamental. If we put our minds to it, we can get back on track. And we cannot, I didn't have the luxury to live in a scenario where you know, I had no income. I had to make a, an income. There's no help here. If you don't have an income, for me, then, you know, you just don't have an income. Um, so, so the reality is that one, one has to, one had to pull finger and do your thing and, 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 and get alive again. And it made me think about what, what is it that we need in a time like this? Um, I think many of the predictions, you guys will just, if you take McKinsey as an example, and I'm sorry to always use them, but they're just a very nice victim to use. Um, people are almost obsessed at the moment, uh, con global consulting firms, to justify themselves and to come out with a prediction, this is what the new future looks like. 
To be honest with you, they actually don't know. It doesn't matter how intelligent, how bright, how clever they are. The reality of the matter is nobody really knows exactly how the world is going to settle after this virus. So whilst we don't actually know definitively, we don't have full certainty. And if we don't have full certainty, we have to do within our context and what we know and what we understand, we've got to look for the opportunities that we can create for ourselves. There is no point in us listening like all the large companies will do to these big consulting firms that tell Barclays or HSBC or Standard Bank or doesn't matter who, this is where the future is going to go. Because frankly, they're mostly wrong. And that's not where the future will go because very few people actually predicted a, a virus like that. Ironically, George Bush did, and he was not one of my favorite people, but he did predict it. Uh, Obama did the same. Uh, Bill Gates did. There are a few people that predict that this is going to happen. The World Health Organization has got a very big mouth now, but they're actually doing nothing in my view. They did not even predict this kind of dilemma as, as dramatic as, as it came about. So people don't know, guys. So I think what I want to tell you is stop reading that because it's nonsense. Most of it will not come to fruition. Uh, it makes us more fearful and more concerned. So I think there's a lot of naivety. Um, Remote working is not new. Online buying is not new. Zoom calls and video calls and Microsoft 365 and all these things are not new. Yes, they now have exploded, but they're not new. Um, so the salience of these matters increased and the acceptance of them by a wider group of companies. Now, that brings a lot of opportunities for all of you guys. That people are now more accepting that you can have meetings like this. You don't have to see people face to face. That means that any one of you sitting in this meeting now or this uh, thing now can do work anywhere in the world. There's no reason why you can't consult to people in Brisbane or in San Francisco or in Helsinki or in Vladivostok or in Accra or it doesn't matter where in the world. So it does open an enormous amount of opportunities, which means that you automatically now are on a global stage and people are not even going to ask you where you operate from. Because I think that has sort of become less, you know, less important than it was maybe five, six months ago. So uncertainty is a prevailing sentiment. We can't change the uncertainty. We can't change the reality of that. Um, so we've got to find ways in which we, we can cope with the future. Um, I had a client that, I have a client that, um, that told me something very, very, in a way, upsetting. But it wasn't, it wasn't new, in a way, because I expected that. She said she works in the insurance industry. Um, and they built a business that became massively successful in a very, very short span of time uh, because their attitude is right. You know, they entered the market with a brilliant idea. They had the right drive. They had the right sentiment. They wanted to make it work. If you look at most of the big insurers in South Africa, as an example, the same in the UK, they're paralyzed. They're sitting in a scenario where they don't know. I believe sometimes is fighting with everybody of not paying out their their claims. Um, so you have a paralyzed position happening where the large companies, somehow the CEOs and the executives believe that everything will be over and COVID will go away and life will be hunky-dory. They will get their big bonuses and the staff will stay and keep their jobs and everything will go back to normal. Now, in my mind, that's a very defeatist attitude. And it would be quite sad if the largest companies in the world think that way. And I'm sad to say I think that's how they think. They think things will go back to normal and everything will be okay. I remember when I worked with Sassel, I worked with Sassel for a long, long time in my life, 14 years. Not for them, with them. They were my client. Um, and they formed, they formed a joint venture with um, AECI to start a business called Polyphon a long time ago. And despite the fact that petrochemicals is a very volatile industry, um, the more we spoke with analysts, the more it became clear that what people were looking for was analysts were saying, I understand your industry is volatile. What I want to know is what you are going to do about it. I don't want to know. I, don't, I know the industry is volatile. You don't have to tell me that. You know, I remember the CEO of, of Mutual and Federal. I don't even know where they still exist, but it was a short-term insurance company in South Africa. If you take 
the CEO many years ago made a statement. It was a very difficult year for the industry. And I thought, how a stupid statement to make, because everybody can read that and know that. That's irrelevant. What I want to know is you, the CEO, what have you done to make it a better year? You know, what have you done to improve it beyond the bad year that it is? And we all can read that in the media. So we, it's, so what I keep on saying to you guys, it's about control. And, and what I had in the polyphon days with the Sassel guy, he, the CEO was a very clever man. And he, he became aware of the fact that if he convinced the analysts and the shareholders and the different people and the staff that he understood the industry was volatile, but that he was capable to navigate through that volatility and that they should have confidence in him and the executive and their ability to navigate the business. And for me, that was an unbelievably positive way to look at the world. Um, that it's not what the world leaves me with, but it's what I can do to change that paradigm. In other words, how can I take this horrible thing that's happened in the world and turn it into an opportunity? Every single one of you, you guys are young, a lot of you, some of you are older like me, but it doesn't matter. We all have opportunities. Let's look at those opportunities because the only thing we can do is we can be stuck in fear and there's nothing we can do it do about it. So if the force of gravity goes down, you can either go down with it um, or you can decide, I don't want to go into that direction. I'm not interested. I need to build my life. I've got a family to support. I've got my own life to build. I want to own a house of my own. I want to do this. I maybe want to travel when we're able to travel again. So, so I want to, I, I was very lucky in my life. Um, I've always gravitated towards entrepreneurs. Yes, I did do work for probably 50, 60 of the top 100 companies, or maybe more, 80 of the top 100 companies in South Africa in my life. And some of them were brilliant companies. I love Sassol. It was an amazing company in its heyday. Um, there are lots of companies that were really incredible businesses. But, but if I look at... Um, the, a lot of the work I did, I was lucky that we launched, I launched Outsurance with five people with the executive of Outsurance at that time. They didn't even have offices. We went together to look for offices. I was lucky that I was at the inception point of a lot of entrepreneurs starting with the excitement and the fear of starting, being given a certain pool of money, but not enough ever, never, it's hardly ever that you get enough money to start a business. Uh, so it's not new and it's not unique. Um, ETV, you know, ETV had to use our offices at the time to have a fax line, to have an email, because they didn't have any of that. Just before they had offices. So yes, I, you know, every single thing they did, we, I was involved in, I was lucky. When Angler Gold was spinned off from Anglo-American, we launched it from the New York Stock Exchange to 90,000 employees around the world in satellite broadcasts. It was incredibly exciting. Bright Rock, an insurance company in South Africa that's done very well. It was split off from Discovery about five years ago. Brilliantly successful. 2020, it was the first online bank of South Africa. Guys, I can go on forever. I've been very lucky that I worked with a lot of entrepreneurial companies. And it makes you realize that none of these entrepreneurial companies, when they started, would have become successful if they dragged themselves into negativity and be told why what they do is not going to work. Um, I had a friend that told me once, and I'll never forget it. If you start a business, like when I started a business, he said to me, just make sure you don't talk to negative people. So if you have negative friends, just see them less. Or just sort of have a better excuse next time they want to see you for a drink. Because you have to cut negative people out of your life at this point. It's not, it's not opportune to talk to negative people. If your mom or dad gives you too much trouble or your sister or brother or your best friend, then you have to just say for now, cool it. I'm not interested in what you're saying. You know, how are you? Are you okay? And, you know... Did you see that movie or did you see that on TV or did you see that video clip? But sort of keep it frivolous. Then, you know, Emirates, very involved with Emirates for a long time in my life. There was a get up and go attitude. They were fortunate they had endless amounts of money. Money was never an issue. That's useful if you have endless amounts of money, but that's rare 
Most companies do not have endless amounts of money, but Emirates had endless amounts of money, so that's useful. Um, I, so I was very lucky. I was involved with MTN, a company that I, to this day, love and respect. I worked with MTN. I was at one point laughed at and said, you are the single longest supply we had because everybody else was fired. Um, and I loved it. I worked with them in Africa, in the Middle East, in Southern Europe, wherever they were. I loved that business because there was a buzz. People wanted to do things. People said yes, not no. The word no was banned from meetings. We couldn't use the word no. You know, you couldn't say, people, people would always say, why not, not why. The word why was banned. So, so you didn't use those words because those were negative words. It means that, you know, if you, if you, if you have people in your company that drag, then they just drag you down. It doesn't work. Um, so I was very really lucky. I did a lot of work here with uh, Centrals and Martins. And for those of you that know about the fashion industry, not that I knew much about the fashion industry, but I do a lot of work here with Centrals and Martins. They're the world's best fashion school. There's one in New York. There's one here. They're the two best fashion schools in the world. Um, and uh, I mean, Alexander McQueen, Stella McCartney, all those people came from the, that school. The degree of entrepreneurship the students are all from, the, you know, India, China, Germany, Brazil, uh, three or four people from Africa, different African countries, not South African, unfortunately, more Northern African. But there is a dynamism and a want to do things and change the way things work that I love. And I was very lucky all of my life. And I say I've been lucky to work with people that want to do things, that want to change the paradigm. And what it's taught me is that do not let your life get distracted by nonsense like a virus. This is, sorry, bullshit. Stop it, guys. If you, if you think about it and people remind you, I said to a friend this morning, you will not use that word again. I don't want to use the name of this thing. You don't use it again. I don't want to hear it anymore. We have to move on with our lives. You know, I want to see my friends again. I want to be able to travel again. I want to do things again. But on the other hand, I've got to carry on with my business and I've got to carry on with my own life and I've got to stay sane. And you can't forever just watch TV, you know, or movies or, or YouTube. Um, so, so what I want to do that gets back to what we all do is we need to be challenger brands. And you all know, you all know what a challenger brand does. A challenger brand basically is a brand that that asks questions um, that other brands are not able to ask. Um, there's, an, there's a wonderful quote from, um, I don't know whether you guys know the brand uh, called, uh, um, what's, the, what's the brand called? Um, Patagonia, the Californian brand. And the CEO of Patagonia makes a very nice statement. He says, if you're not pissing off at least 50% of the people, you're not trying hard enough. And that is the principle of a challenger brand. Now, Outsurance was a challenger brand. It entered an industry where the first direct insurance company, with, with turning the name around from insurance to outsurance, um, making people believe they will always get something out, and, and it was absolutely factual when it launched. So it went into an industry, and it disrupted the entire way the industry thought and worked. Uh, and I can carry on. Bright Rock came up with a new business concept that was novel and it was a world first. Nobody else had ever done that before. Um, you know, Uber, as you guys know, came up with a new way in which people get transported from one point to another. There are three million people every day in London that use us. It's the largest single market for Uber in the world. Three million people a day get transported by Uber here. Yeah. So, so, you know, Google, it gave you accessible every single one of us. You can access data from all over the world because of Google. Amazon, you know, I mean, I don't buy many things that I do not buy from Amazon. The only things I don't buy from Amazon is groceries. I don't really like them for groceries. Um, but every other thing, if I, need, if I need batteries tomorrow morning, I'll later today go into Amazon, and tomorrow morning they will deliver my batteries. If I need whatever, if I need a bulb to replace, I will go into Amazon and I'll buy that. Amazon has changed the paradigm of buying online 
for the entire world, and and the same in um, with Alibaba in uh, in China. Um, so what do you, what do you do if you are a challenger brand? A challenger brand means that you're aggressive, and by aggressive, I would rather say assertive. Aggressive does aggressive doesn't always mean you're nasty or negative, but it means you're determined. You go into an industry like Outsurance did. And you said, I want to one day dominate this industry. Today it does, even though at the time Suntam was a massive competitor that had, I think, 70% of the market. They basically turned that around and our insurance is today as big as they are because of the fact that there was a belief we can change the way people buy short-term insurance. And again, later, you know, they did the same with life insurance. Um, they, they've got confidence. Guys, you want we have to have confidence in ourselves and and challenger brands generally are confident the people believe they will work and succeed against the odds if you don't believe it nobody else will and that is again why i'm saying do not listen to negativity and negative people be bold in other words you know, challenger brands will state what they stand for they don't have a problem that i mean if you think about when kalula was launched uh, sadly, I think it lost direction over time. But when Kalula was launched in South Africa, it was a very bold brand. People laughed about it. It was fun. You thought you, you know, all of a sudden you realized I can actually fly for a lot less. But you wanted to fly them because they were fun and interesting and dynamic against BA and SAA and the rest of the boring crowd. You know, Virgin Atlantic people like Virgin Atlantic because it's a fun airline. It's not like British Airways or Lufthansa. It's a different kind of airline. You've got to, you want to be unapologetic and intrusive. You've got to be self-aware. You've got to be a thought leader. In other words, think up new things, dream up new ideas, you know, ideas. You know, don't just take what consulting firms and the world is predicting you about the future because frankly they don't know you have as much right to talk and say things today you have the same access to the internet there's no reason why you cannot become a thought leader in your own business and own industry and a thought leader means that you're not necessarily log, log jammed by what the prevailing thought thought process is you're not a thought leader if you simply say what everybody else is saying you've got to break out of it so Again, don't be hamstrung by the negativity of this COVID pandemic. Look at what you can do with it and how you can turn it around. You want to be in a hurry. I mean, the very first day we launched our insurance, we knew that we could, we only had so much marketing money. They only had so many people on, on, on incoming um, uh, call uh, in the incoming call center. So we knew that we couldn't get 2,000 calls in the first day because they didn't have the capacity to deal with that. And what you don't want is clients coming on, potentially coming on, and then they can't get through to the, to the call center. Obviously, that's very negative. So we needed 1,000 calls. By 4 o'clock that afternoon, the guy that started this a guy called Rene Otto, a brilliant guy. He gave me a call at four past four minutes past four that afternoon. He said to me, you know, Thomas, we had, no, at four o'clock. He said, you know, at four o'clock on the dot now, we've had a thousand and four calls, exactly as many as we wanted. We wanted a thousand. Guys, this was not easy. I had to do projective models about how much of this will give us that. I literally had to become a statistical guru. But it was fascinating. It was a challenge. And this guy was hell of a clever. He was a lawyer. So he gave me a lot of appeal and drama. And he was m amazing because, he, fought, because he, fought, he, he, he forced me to think differently and to think out of the box and do things as marketing people don't like doing. And that's to commit yourself that what I want to do now is going to cost this much, but it's actually going to work. <laughs> and that was one good thing that sassled it. You know, all the engineers, they would say, fine, we'll give you 10 million rand. But then, then you have to commit yourself that this is what you're going to do. And if you don't get it right, then I'm going to fire you. And that's how they work. And it was brilliant because I always was sitting on tender hooks about, oh, wow, okay, I have to pull finger and I've got to do things that are unusual here. 
You've got to become emotional and passionate. I've never seen a challenger brand where the staff are not passionate. There's a there's a there's a there's a, um, a, a, a an estate agency brand in the UK called Zupla. It's a very nice challenger brand. Looks a bit like Hollard, the same kind of purple color. They're out there. They're crazy. They're all over the place. But the if you meet the people that work for Zoopla, they are so passionate about what they're doing. They live their business every single day. And they, they came into the market, they dominate today, and they had very strong brands against them, but lots more money. And, then, and, and also, you've got to, if you want to be a challenger brand, you've got to believe in marketing. But, but, but understand that belief in marketing does not mean that you have a lot of money for marketing. Because I can promise you, in most instances, challenger brands do not have a lot of money for marketing. You actually have to extract far better ideas and be far more creative and think far more out of the box for a challenger brand than you often have to, um, than you often are able to do for other brands. So ask yourself, how do you become a challenger brand? There's a lot published on it. Um, there's a lot of things you can read. I'm sure you've handled the topic and know the topic yourself. But ask yourself, every single one of you, how, how can I become more of a challenger brand? How can I create more of an opportunity for myself? Because there is no point in becoming one of the masses right now that is in the doldrums and down and depressed because they've lost their jobs or they have no idea what to do with their future. Unfortunately, I don't have a wealthy parent. I don't have a wealthy anybody. So like I'm sure most of you, we all have to do our own thing and work for ourselves. Not many people in the world have wealthy people that will support them. So we all know, you know, it's up to us to make things happen. Um, so just to conclude, um, and then we can chat uh, as long as you want to, ask you, please, guys, be a challenger brand. Create your own market. Create your own convention. Be customer obsessed. Just decide who do you want to work with. Become value obsessed. In other words, deliver value that currently is not being delivered by other people. In other words, challenge yourself to think differently, not to fall into the trap of prevailing thinking. Um, so when there is no market growth to be had, that for me is the issue. So if a market is stagnant, you can still grab market share. I'm working with a business in Durban that's become phenomenally successful for confidential reasons. I can't tell you who it is right now. It's a brand I created from scratch, literally. These guys are amazing and they really know how to run a business. All I did was to create the brand. That thing is now by far the most successful in this category. And this is a year and a half later. Because you can grow market share you can go to value of your business, even if the industry is not growing. So just, you know, if you listen to people telling you that the markets are not growing, it does not mean you cannot grow market share. Just always remember that. You can always steal share from somebody else. There's always share to be stolen from Sunlum or Mutual or those guys, and Standard Bank and, you know, all those people. Then the next thing my one old professor told me, life is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. When you sit down at your desk and just start, things happen magically. In other words, if you wait for inspiration, nothing will ever happen. If you go down, as my professor used to say to me, Thomas, just go and sit on your bum behind your computer or just go and sit down. Things will happen. But if you walk around and mull it over, it's not going to happen. Nothing will happen. Um, and, and it's amazing when you start writing and you start thinking that things actually start working and you become positive and you become interested. So attitude and action is a critical thing. Become active, be involved, be engaged, force yourself, listen to new stuff, read, listen to talks, listen to TED Talks. There's so much access to the stuff today. Write, it opens our minds. Talk to people that are novel and interesting and different. Don't mingle with negative people. Don't deal with negative clients. I can't deal with negative clients. I've now decided forever that's over. I will never deal with a negative client again. A client in the first day, if uh, first words, if they say things can't be done, then you know maybe they must go to Ogilvy or JW Tom or JWT or 
go and work for Saatchi and Saatchi. But I don't want to. I don't want negativity around me. So I can just ask you, please take this point. Don't mix with negative people right now. It's the worst thing you can do. And then, as our old, old icon Nelson Mandela said. It is really how we deal with life's blows that make us excel. It is not the fact that we will all have blows. That's nature and that's life. But it's how we handle those that will make us excel and make us be different. So all I'm asking you guys, be challenger brands, because that's the only thing we can be right now. Okay. I hope that made sense. Hi Thomas, it's Anissa here. How are you? No, I'm fine. You sorry, you speaking? I'm I didn't good. Speak. Good. I'm good. And I wanted to ask you. I mean, uh, in the banking sector, um, there was a specific brand that, in its heyday, was a challenger brand um, and gone through a hell of a lot of change and turmoil, etc. How does one go from being a challenger brand? going to the depths of despair where they are and then building up again to me it's got a lot to do with leadership um and yeah. it's sad to see a brand like that going by the wayside um and i think leadership generally worldwide is lacking um is there is there and what from a marketing because every single more you can throw as much marketing rand behind a company like that and i don't think it's really going to work what's your view on that if you, know, should... you, know, you know, I mean, a challenger brand will also only remain a challenger brand for as long as it can sustain that kind of momentum. And the way you sustain that kind of momentum, in my view, is innovation. Um, ironically, the, there was a survey that was conducted a while ago by one of the consulting firms. I think it was actually McKinsey. That was one of the useful things they did. Um, that, <laughs> That that said, uh, that said, um, that something like seventy nine percent of of thousands of CEOs they spoke with and executives said that innovation will drive the future, and that only only twenty percent of them, or twenty one I think percent of them, said they had the executives and the capability to deal with that. So there's a massive discrepancy between people's belief that things will change and the people they have that can actually execute on that change. So you are absolutely right. It is leadership. It is leadership. And you retain your if you retain your challenger status, you will only retain it because you have consecutive innovation. You can remain a challenger brand forever. And you can remain a challenger brand the day that you are a massive brand. You can only do it if you keep on innovating. And that yes. principle is true about everybody. Now, the problem is what often happens, Anissa, is, is exactly leadership. What often happens is the people that start the challenger brand business are often really entrepreneurial. They're not good with maintaining a business. Then you eventually have corporate types that they poach from other companies that are this, in the same industry. So, so a challenger bank will poach somebody from Standard Bank or APSA. That person will then become the person that runs this business. That person has an incapacity, often, to challenge convention and think different because they come from a comfort zone. You know, if you work for a major company, frankly, guys, in a way, it doesn't matter what you do. It will still be okay. It will carry on. It may not always carry on well, but it will carry on. So you don't really – there's not much a CEO that's useless can do to kill a company. You can. But <laughs> There, there are examples, but there are lots of really pretty useless executives that sit in large companies. Sorry, I'm not the only one to say that. I'm sure you see it every day. Um, that that cannot innovate. That can only say no. That's why I use the example of MTN. You know, if you have, I mean, a Petuman Schleker, Schleku that that at the time led the massive expansion of the business into Africa and the Middle East. He was an absolute visionary, that man. He was an absolute, absolute visionary. So he was able to change the convention. Unfortunately, the guys after him could not really do it to the same extent. 
Now, so, so, so you, you do, it's a lot is about leadership. Nobody ever, I think, thought for a second that he would fail in anything he did because the conviction was there, the belief was there, and frankly, everything he did worked. And he took massive risks, but he was prepared to take those risks. And he took full responsibility for those risks. So he made a lot of money, but I always said they can give him 10 times more money. I don't care how much money he gets. He can get as much money as he should get. It's not about how much money you get, it's whether you deliver. You know, we can, we can pay any politician a billion rand a year. Happy for that. But then this politician must do his job or her job. You know, so, so it doesn't, so, so the, the leadership, you know, the, the leadership vacuum is enormous. And I think if anything, it's become clear the polit pol political leadership gap in the world, the business leadership gap in the world at the moment is more evident than it's ever been. And that's quite sad because now the world actually needed some leadership because people like us are affected. You know, we are all affected by this virus. Um, yeah. But there's no leaders to listen to because all they do is talk nonsense. You know, Boris Johnson is more interested in his hairstyle and now, uh -huh. and now losing weight because he's, uh, he's now decided he's on this uh, weight thing, which is good. I don't blame him. I should also be more on the weight thing than, he, than I am. But the point is the guys, there's no vision being shown. There's no, you know, there's no leadership. So you're absolutely right, Denisa. I don't think I'm answering your question because I don't actually know how, no. how you make people leaders that just have an in, incapacity to become leaders. Yeah, you see, it's a, again all about attitude in my opinion. But I do believe from an education perspective, universities like ourselves need to start looking also at what do we need to do to help build that leadership capability and not just take it from an academic perspective as well. But I had another question. I Sorry, I was rude. agree with that. Sorry, Nisa, you're absolutely right. If you only look at it, you've got to start bringing neuroscience and all those other things. Yeah. With. because the reality of the matter is that's where the deficiency lies most leaders can't even listen to people talking they're not even yeah. listening to their staff they're not really yeah. interested they may tell you they are but they're frankly not really interested absolutely um, but the other thing is you spoke a lot about innovation and you know innovation is an anomaly for me i think it's all about the way you think and how you conceptualize ideas but companies made the f fundamental mistake to say we're innovative so let's start an innovation department and then they put in beautiful wallpaper crazy furniture and everyone yeah. would sit there and wonder you know. to me, innovation in today's society is just getting the basics right and from there then you go and in and you come up with these big hairy audacious ideas that you can implement because if i look at it from a south african context in terms of the kind of service delivery we're just getting in terms of our our government departments innovation for them at that level is merely being able to answer the call within three seconds being able to answer the question the customer is giving you so innovation is quite a broad term what's your view on that no it is <laughs> It is, and but I must tell you, I think, I think, I think you have to deliver on your promise, regardless. If you're, if if you don't get the fundamentals of a business right, you know, I mean, always use the term thing. If if I don't have, if I'm an aer, if I'm an airline, I have to have access to airplanes. I don't have to own them, but I have to have access to airplanes. I've got to have routes and places where I can land and take off from and land, you know, and take people from and to. So I've got to have that, and I need staff that will operate this this airline. But so there are basic things I need. But what will make me excel beyond that will be what Emirates did to redefine the service concept, and they did it well, and it became part of the DNA of the business. So if it's not part of the DNA of the business, you cannot become innovative, and you cannot become dynamic. There's a lot. There's enough that's been said about the culture. Of innovation and if if there's not a culture of innovation that permeates every single thing and unfortunately it starts at the top you know that's one of those little things that start at the top because the easiest way I always used to say to people I mean and, and this is meant in sincerity and love because I really have a lot of respect for Unilever but I always used to say to people you know if you work for Unilever for three years it's too long 
but please work for them for two years. Because it teaches you a discipline. This is how business works. Unilever is a brilliant training school. It tells you this is how running brands work. And it's fundamental and it's correct because it gets, you tick all the boxes. These are the things you have to do and this is how you do them. This is the quality of product we make. We don't make worse quality. This is what we make. You know, these are the standards. These are the rigors we work towards. So you can only innovate once you've done that, you know. And then you've got massive issues on innovation, like is it incremental innovation? Is it disruptive innovation? That's, I'm sure you guys are aware of those kinds of notions. And there's lots of words around them in terms of wordplay, you know, people coming up with different thoughts on innovation, whether it's product innovation or whether it's service innovation or whether you move from a product to a service industry. There are all sorts of notions like that that I'm sure you guys are well aware of. But if the culture of the leadership and the culture of the business and the DNA of the business isn't there, Apple, however much I think Tim Cook is a great person, Apple lost innovation the day that Steve Jobs died. It will take a long and gradual decline because it's too big to fail. It will maybe take 20, 30 years for Apple to go down to just another brand that we use. But the reality is the day that Steve Jobs, in the DNA of that person, and the people that that person appointed, and we hear a lot of things that he was actually a horrible person to work with, and some people say he was amazing, because I think people, in a way, also end up working with the people that are similar to them. And I think, obviously, he attracted people that were similar to him and thinking that way and were able to execute on what he wanted. You know, if you read the same with Elon Musk, <coughs> Elon Musk apparently is impossible, but he loves his family, and they say he will do anything for a friend. So if, if he has to get to a friend in an hour, he will get into a private jet and go to this friend in the middle of the night if it's necessary. So apparently, there's a lot of humanity there that we don't see and people won't realize. But the reality is, why is he successful? Because he, he knows the detail. He has a big enough dream, but he also knows the detail of exactly how things work. The same with Steve Jobs. So, so, in my view, culture is fundamental if you want to innovate. And it doesn't matter what level of innovation. There's, you've got to understand the business. You've got to, you've got to be open-minded. I mean, the stuff, Nisa, I'm sure you guys know, but this is such a broad topic. But the, I don't like personally using the word innovation. I, 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 often, I often try and get away from it. Because, you know, so many people use it, and I think we use it wrongly often. Um, but culture for me in a company is everything. If the culture in a company is right, you can do anything. There's no limitations. If the culture is wrong, you're dead. Thomas. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, Hello, Adam. I uh, have heard you now talk about leadership, and you, in your uh, discussion, you've uh, mentioned a number of important characteristics uh, that you associate with leaders. Now, uh, I'm afraid it's a trick question I'm asking you, but uh, do you think that that kind of person is born or are they made? Uh, I think they can be born and I think they can be made. I think, I don't, I don't think they, I think as we all grow, Arman, you will know, uh, as we all grow and evolve as people, hopefully we, we all try to do that. Um, as we mature and we try and grow, and hopefully we will grow until the day we die. That's always what I believed about Peter Drucker. He was in his 80s, and you guys know he still came up with novel thoughts and ideas, and he was always reading more. And you know, so so I think I think we carry on learning. So I really believe that. For me, the, the big thing that I believe in, what's helped me in my life, and I mean, just a tiny little person sitting here in a tiny little flat in London, but what's helped me a lot in my life is the issue of authenticity. I think the more we can, as people grow, to become true to what we are, the less we are, the less we are disrupted by negativity, disrupted by people challenging your thought process, because you will be able to handle that because you know what you stand for. Um, so for me, authenticity is a time 
takes growth. I don't think you're easily born with, I think you're born with authenticity, but I think by the time you're nine years old, the school has killed that and your parents. So, so unfortunately, you know, the school system worldwide, it's not South Africa or any country, it's I think worldwide, the school system, the parents, I think often call, kill our authenticities. Then we have to start again and try and grow. So I think some of us may grow up in a household where we are exposed to dynamic thinking, new ideas, and we will probably grow up very open-minded. I was lucky I had a mom and a dad like that. So I was lucky. I was never told you can't do that. I was always told you can do whatever you like. Carry on. And if you really get naughty, I will give you a hell of a hiding. Um, but but I, th I, think, I think you can learn the principles of it. But in my view, to go back to the comment I made to Anissa, I think things like neuroscience, things like, you know, how science and I think uh, human humanity connect, um, you know, the, the soft parts of, of, of life, the soft parts of personality and the way people evolve, I think all those things will make us more authentic. I think if we are more authentic as individuals, we will be able to, in my view, be more authentic as leaders, um, and and we will let we will also I think be less scared about what we want to do going forward. So, I believe honestly we can teach people to become like that. We can teach them to be open to it. Um, we can teach them to be more receptive to ideas. We can teach them to listen more to other people. We can teach them to be less fearful of change a, a lot of that stuff i think we can teach people so i mean to go back to your you know the trick question because it is a you know it is a trick question in a way i must tell you the longer i live the more i think we learn to become leaders more than we're born to be leaders so maybe when i was two years old i had a capability to lead but that was then killed um, certainly by my history teacher who was a horrible person and my maths teacher who she was a crazy person. Um, the only thing I remember was her bunny and nothing else. <laughs> um, and so, so yes, a lot of that was killed, but fortunately we grow and we evolve and we develop, you know, so, so I think you guys have an enormous role to play, Herman, in my view, a hell of a big role to play in getting people's mental attitudes right. I know that's never the way we look at curriculums because curriculums tend to be, this is what you need to tell people to pass this exam. But there's so many soft variables that we often do not emphasize, you know? And that's a big deficiency. Why, why have MBAs become problematic in the world? Because, and why am I negative about consulting firms? Because, you know, Professor Gary Hamill, some of you will know about him. He makes a fundamental statement that I think is so truthful. He says that the problem with consulting is that people infect all companies with the same virus. So as McKinsey goes from one to the next to the next to the next company, they all get the same virus. So now they're all ill, you know, and the more ill they become, the more there's work for McKinsey, you know, and Accenture and all of it, same thing. Um, you know, so, so, so it's a wonderful statement, I think, you know, let's not infect everybody with the same virus. Hi, Thomas. Yes. Um, I just wanted to find out, so the examples that you gave with regards to being challenger brands were all regarding demergers and new businesses. Do you have any input on long established older businesses? Um, that we could move towards the challenger way without reinventing completely or rocking the boat and upsetting management. If if it if you if there is almost nothing you can do to become a challenger brand that will not upset traditional management. So let me just handle that for one. You you cannot. It's not. It's basically I think almost impossible. You 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 know you need to. Current management in many large organizations, you know, that that is the problem. The The second thing is it's it's very difficult to start. I've seen this often for businesses to start another meeting uh, or another business unit that will focus on um, 
an innovation or the innovation space or come up with new ideas or come be a challenger brand. This largely does not work. Eventually, all these companies get, um, all these entities get dragged back into the main company. You, one of the only examples that's successful was Nespresso. Now, Nespresso was a challenger brand. I don't, I'm not a big, I'm not, I'm not a lover of Nestle, but Nespresso was a challenger brand. It was taken outside of Nestle for the right reasons because Nestle is very conservative, typical Swiss company, um, very efficiently run but a conservative business. However, as Nespresso became more and more successful and became more profitable, eventually it was pulled back into, um, you know, into, into Nestle. Um, now, whether it can sustain that when it's part of Nestle, I don't know. Um, the, the same with Toyota and Lexus. Lexus was specifically started on the sideline because people did not perceive Toyota as being able to compete with Mercedes and uh, BMW in the US. So Lexus was started. As Lexus became more successful, Toyota wanted it back. So it took it back. You know, now, when, when the first online bank in the world was a bank called Egg. Egg was bought... Um, I think it was started in the UK. It was bought by, um, by Citicorp, the American bank. Within one year, the bank was closed. So, so again, it's a cultural issue. I don't know whether, Mandy, I'm answering you. I don't know. It's a, you know am I answering you or not? Um, I, I think yes and no. I think basically the idea is to, to move away and not just evolve what currently exists. No, no, no. You can evolve what currently exists. There's no, there's no reason not to, because you can evolve what currently exists. I mean, you know, I mean, Amazon evolves all the time. You know, it's Amazon is no longer new. Amazon is, I don't know, 25 years old. It's no longer a new brand. Um, it's no longer a new business. You know, I think there are businesses. 3M, to use an example, you will know. 3M over. A hell of a long period of time have been phenomenally successful at innovation so the business clearly has a dna of innovation so 3m is an old old business but it's been very successful at that so you do get businesses like that there was a period of time that standard bank for 10 15 years led innovation in south africa then then there was a period where fnb when michael Jordan was there was a highly successful innovative bank and what michael did a lot of the stuff was stuff that he just packed differently and came up with ideas that consumers loved and we he leveraged existing things to do it i mean it wasn't dramatically new things but he was clever enough to see the gaps and the opportunities and it all of a sudden resurrected changed the entire fmb profile they started attracting new customers. The bank was changed overnight. I almost became an F&B customer. And I always used to say I'll never bank there because I don't find it a nice brand. So, so, you know, a lot of it, in my view, again, goes back to mental attitude and the agility and the capability to think different. Thank you. I mean, Sassol is another, not Sassol, uh, Colgate is another good example. If you look at the history of Colgate, the times that it became more dynamic as a business, it changed the trajectory of the company every single time. Look at what Unilever did with Dove. Unilever is an old, old company, but it redefined its entire future in a way by doing one thing, and that was Dove. You know, so there's a lot of the guys that's done good things. Thomas, I'd like to ask you, in your view, who in South Africa do you think is a challenger brand and why? Uh, at the, are, you, are you talking about right now in the last year or five or are you talking yes. about in general? Yes. Currently, yes. Well, I can't tell you all the innovation that happened. I, you know, about six years ago I came here, so I can't tell you exactly what the what new brands there are that are challenger brands that I don't really don't just don't know uh, I mean historically Kalula was but I think over time they lost that edge um, 
our children's was. I think over time they retained some of the edge, not all of it. So I think they, they did retain some of the edge, but in my view, they should have innovated more regularly. I mean, I always had a sort of recipe in my head. You need to innovate in some way every year or, you know, at least every two years. If you start losing that, you know, then your innovation call it what's the word not aptitude your innovation um, there's a word for it um, I don't know um, it sort of recedes you know you become you, you your perceptual the perceptual side of your innovation thing becomes less um, yeah let me just think what brands are there that I think have done this um, that I can uh, or maybe maybe I'll turn it around to ask you what do you think um, we as an educational brand should be doing to challenge our competitors? I, you know, I, my view is you you should. I think one should spend a lot more time making the curriculum i don't know what your curriculum is so i've not maybe you're doing it maybe you're not doing it i don't know what you're doing but is to make your curriculum very much focused on the kind of realities that that comes from people that often are going to be entrepreneurial because a lot of the people that's probably on this call will become entrepreneurs and will probably end up working for themselves and hopefully will go into large companies and try and upset the apple cart and make people think differently and come up with new stuff. So in my view is I would bias a huge amount of the thinking to how do you, you know, leadership within organizations, bringing the soft variables of it into it, I would become... I would look at the mix between creativity. Creativity is a critical component of it. Lateral thinking is a critical component. I would bring a lot of those elements of the softer sciences into it. Yes, of course, there are basic things we all need to know. But, you know, once you know the rules, you can break the rules. So there's a rule book we all need to understand. But the rule book must not be 70, 80% of what we do. In my view, 60, 70 percent has got to be how I leverage and interpret what you've given me and and do something new with it. In other words, how do I give how do you guys give people the tools and the way of thinking and the way of working that will make them more dynamic and better leaders and better call it exponents of new businesses, new companies, new brands going forward. So you know, for me, the big thing is if you look at South Africa and Africa, where's the big opportunity for Africa? It's to think different and come up with new ideas and new thoughts. That's the opportunity of Africa. There's a greenfield opportunity for every single person in Africa to do that. It's hard when you're in the UK because in Europe, people think everything has been done. So nothing is new. You know, in South Africa, you don't have that problem. People are dynamic. They still think forward. You know, mm. You, you, you've got a mental aptitude that you can, you can take and I think mold. So in my view, you know, if you guys want to look at a bigger vision, I would say if you can shape leaders that are able to create the opportunities for Africa, create the opportunities for the world, in fact, because you have a way of thinking, a way of working, a way of leading that is different, that takes, you know, the full human into perspective, that has real insight into what people want, people need. Not just apply the principles, you know, not just not just look at disciplines like, you know, if I'm in HR, I'm not supposed to comment on money. Of course I can comment on money. So kill those disciplines off, you know. In my view, we've, we should no longer have disciplines. We should stop disciplines. Disciplines is we fragmented business because of disciplines. Um, and yes, I understand there are certain principles of finance that you need to understand, but it doesn't mean if I'm in marketing, I can't comment on finance. Absolutely. What we've done, we've created these little silos and silos have killed business. Sorry, that's another massive hobby horse of mine, but silos have really, really killed business. But if you're an entrepreneur, you have to do all of it. You know, if you're on your own, you have to make sure you get money in. You've got to make sure the marketing works. You've got to make sure the staff is happy. You know, you've got to do all of it. You, you don't have people to do it. You've got to do it. 
So mm -hmm. let's retain that principle if we can. Thank you very much. Was, uh, another trick question for me. Uh, do you think that entrepreneurship, uh, that propensity to be an entrepreneur, can be taught or, or not? Oh, absolutely, it can be taught. I've got no doubt. I think a lot of us get taught that by default because we don't want or can't get the job we want or we don't want the job we can get. Um, and yeah, you know, so I think, Erman, you, I think by default we end up having to be entrepreneurs. So I think all we can do is if you guys can upskill me in being a better entrepreneur, in having more foundational knowledge, which of course I have to have, I need to understand finance, I need to understand the principles of some stuff. Um, but if you can, you can, you can help me become a better entrepreneur. But I don't think you need to be born an entrepreneur. I think, my, again, I think we're all born entrepreneurs. I think we're all born with a clean slate. We can do whatever we like with life. Unfortunately, over time, we start believing that. So in my view, again, you know, that's one of the soft parts. If you guys as a business, uh, as an entity, can help me grow that capability that I have self-belief, that I'm ha happy to risk, that I'm willing to risk, whilst I understand the, the downsides of risking and, the, you know, the risks I, I'm, I'm getting myself into, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Guys, anything else? Any any last questions from anyone? Otherwise, we're going to let Dr. Wisleysen go. Having Tanya, do, are you? Do you want to no, say? I'm good. no, I just I'd want like to say thank you. Yeah, Tanya, you go on. Thank you. You go on. No, I just wanted to say thank you. That's all. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I did want to ask a question. I'm Smita. I'm from uh, India. Um, yeah. This particular uh, terminology that we used and the word that is used, authenticity, um, it has always confused me because everybody seems to have a different interpretation on it. Um, in closing, I'd like to hear a little bit more about this word authenticity authenticity you did speak about it you did refer to it uh, i'd like a little bit more on this if it's possible please thank you so much i guess Mita, i think you guys are you you live in india right absolutely okay now you will know that if there's one country in the world that is truly authentic it's i believe india because you, you the the i think in a way the the way in which I think the culture of the country is developed is that people are far closer to what they are than, you know, what many people in the West are. Um, because, you know, people are more real. They, they're more in touch with other people around them. They're more in touch with themselves. You know, things like meditation and, you know, shamans and all those people that people teach guys in America 100 years later you guys all grew up with so in my that is for me the essence of authenticity is knowing who you are what what makes you get up in the morning what makes you happy what are the things that make you feel a valued part of society what are the things that make you creative what are the things that inspire you you know how do you relate to other people how do people perceive you how do people you know talk to you how do you engage with other people and so what for me authenticity is knowing who you really are as a human being what you want out of life you know what makes you feel good and bad you know what are the okay. things that make you happy those things okay. are the fundamental real things about life the things that are not taught in textbooks but um the things that are true about about us in life now often the more money we get um the more isolated we become, the harder it is, for instance, in this virus scenario for people to live because, you know, they all of a sudden are, are no longer able to distract themselves by drinking lots and doing this and doing that. 
we are forced to confront our own beings. So for me, it is the being you are. I don't know, Smita, whether that it's a hell of a big topic you're now into. Yeah. Um, but for me, authenticity is really trying to discover yourself. Who you are, what makes you Smita, what makes you happy, what makes you love life, what makes you jumping out of bed in the morning, what makes you feel bad in the morning. You know, what are those things that give you and creates the meaning of your life to yourself? Because if you don't know that, it's very, very difficult because then we end up with artificial, we, we end up wearing masks, all of us. Um, and it's, what happens if your mask is off? Who are you? Is, are you somebody people want to get on with? Or, are you somebody people love naturally? Are you somebody they trust you know, are you somebody that's positive about what you can do? Those things, I think, are the things that make us real. Okay. Um, uh, it always confused me. But, uh, isn't that the way people normally are? Aren't we always <laughs> trying to figure out who we I are? Can, I can promise I'm you. Sorry, it, 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 that's why I, I said can, it. That's I, why I'm saying this, but I don't <laughs> understand why. Why does it need to be? Is it not the way we all are? No, it's not so the way we all are. Unfortunately, the way we all are is we become distracted. The bigger car we need, we all need a bigger car. We need a bigger title. We, uh -huh. we want to be a film star. Okay. We want to be a big okay. singer. We want to be a, 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 you know, a football hero. We, we want to also wear expensive clothes. We want to have a Rolex. We want all that stuff. That's all, that's stuff that distracts us from being who we are. That's why I made the comment, I think you lucky, because I think that's more ingrained in Indian society than in most other countries, you know. I mean, I think China is almost the extreme of that. You are, uh, you are looked at, I mean, Nigeria is probably in a way one of the other extremes, is people look at you as to how much assets do you have, you know. Can you afford a private jet? Can you do this? Can you do that? Um, whereas I think a lot of that becomes superficial stuff. It's not, I'm not saying those things are wrong, guys. That's not the point. It is just saying that once you know who you are, you probably will end up getting a lot of that stuff anyway. But the problem is we often use that stuff to make us feel better about ourselves. Whereas okay. authenticity is when you. you don't need any of that. You can live Thank in a tiny little house and be very happy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I did want to have another point of view on it, and I no, do appreciate your observations. Thank you very much. That's a, pr a pleasure. Anyone else? Thomas, I think no, we've with all a lot of people. Rihanna, do you have a question? No, no, no. I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Well, in that case, we're going to let Thomas go enjoy his weekend. Thank you so much. We really appreciate this. We'd love to have a follow-up session with you. No, if, you're if, welcome. I, I can send you the presentation I did if you want it. Yes, please. We'll but share it. Order. That's, uh, I mean, Sorry. basically all I've done is just you know, take what I what I have, um, but I can send it to you, Shomay. Absolutely, we'll post it on the website under the um, um, events section, together with your presentation. Thank you so much for your time. No, it's a great pleasure, guys, and I can just wish you all the best of luck and just go for it. You know, all we can do is we need to get up in the morning and be self-starters and just go for it. Eventually, I do believe it pays off. You know, sometimes it's hard to understand that, and sometimes for me it's very hard to believe it. But it does pay off eventually. <laughs> so all the best, and um, and yeah, let's all survive this lockdown. <laughs> Absolutely, you inspired us. Very okay, much. Uh, and thanks for all your kind comments on the on the on the list on the right. <laughs> thanks. Goodbye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye, guys. Bye -bye. Good weekend. Thank you very much. Bye bye.